Hello, this is Kevin Prince, and welcome back one more time to the Market Insights webinar. So pleased to offer this as a, an extra way of reaching out to you during this crisis that we're all going through together. And like always, we're going to spend the next 30, maybe 35 minutes, and we're going to provide you some insights to the overall marketplace, of course, and then, of course, take some questions at the end, too, where we had them submitted to us in advance. And really, thank you for those of you out there that took the time and effort to send us a question in advance. All that really helps because that helps us drive our content as well as helps drive uh, the co communication we have with you to really make this tailored towards your needs. So with that, let's get started. Just like in the past shows, we want to quickly highlight that this is Market Insights. This is not uh, recommendations, just more insights in marketplace. And from an advice perspective, don't forget that this again is insights, not advice. So, you know, take this as some good education marketplace and some good uh, responses to questions. And I'm going to highlight some of our guests today and really excited to have Marina Metz coming in just from FTSE Russell. Now, Marina is the North American head of fixed income for FTSE Russell himself. So, so good to have you. As well as joining us one more time is Mackenzie Bach, Mackenzie Box, sorry, Mackenzie, uh, Senior Product Manager of BMO ETFs. And we're going to start off a little bit of a background. I talked to Marina and she gave us some, asked her to give us some insights around FTSE again, but this is really giving a little more, a little more slice of the, uh, slice of the uh, company, showing you what really serve, what they're doing for the industry in general around research and what they mean towards us. Marina, can you walk us through some of your uh, FTSE Russell by the numbers? Absolutely, and thank you, Kevin. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm uh, really looking forward to uh, speaking with uh, the audience today. Um, so, you know, FTSE tend to be more of an institutional provider, but they impact all of our daily lives, and the information that we supply into the market has that kind of impact. So just to give a sense of the type of services that we provide and who we deal with, um, FTSE are the number one provider of Canadian fixed income indexes, um, as well as uh, the number one provider for all institutional passive and active funds. Um, we have currently in the market over 85 Canadian ETFs with almost $40 billion um, in tracking. And we deal, um, and so this is just for Canada. And of course, globally, that uh, record repeats itself more broadly. And typically, we deal with um, you know, all of the top asset managers, including, of course, BMO, um, and all of the investment banks. And what I thought an interesting statistic uh, as I was preparing for this is out of the top six um, ETFs that are uh, by uh, market capitalization in Canada, we have five of those top six. So that's, um, you know, it, it speaks volumes to the depth and breadth and longevity of the information that we provide. Um, and then just moving on to the next couple of slides, Kevin, what I thought would be interesting is, you know, in supporting all of the users as we um, deal with and track the impact of coronavirus, um, I thought it'd be interesting to share um, some of the information that FTSE Russell is publishing broadly to the market in order to be able to support all of our uh, clients and users and people that track and care about the indexes with information. So um, on the next slide here, this is a sample of our research portal, which is free to the market, that continues to track global markets and put out information um, looking at the impact of coronavirus that's having on the global markets and global market performance and different um, different uh, behaviors of uh, different asset categories and asset classes. And then more specifically to fixed income, on the next slide here, um, these are a number of reports that we put out uh, to the public as well that look at specifically the Canadian fixed income portion, uh, changes of markets over time, um, how those markets behave, the extensions of the indexes. And uh, so we've given uh, the websites here, and I'd encourage everyone who's interested to be able to go ahead and take a look at these. And we continue to put out relevant and timely information um, to support uh, users uh, tracking, uh, tracking the market and, and give them more tools uh, to be able to do so. Marina, that's fantastic. Good over the good over FTSE itself, but also 
the support to your stakeholders right across the board as a stakeholder myself and the end investors out there, real good support and, and some pretty interesting research. I do encourage you to take a time and effort, go to that research.footsierussell.com and dive in there and take a little bit of a look. So let's, let's take the next step and let's talk about today's topic because today's topic is around being tactical and fixed income. But when being tactical and fixed income, let's lay a little bit of framework around that. And I'm gonna ask Mackenzie to come in here and. I think the first level framework is get a little bit of understanding of uh, what to look at. And we'll spend some slides around those. I know you prepared them in advance. So Mackenzie, maybe take it away. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. And thank you everyone for joining us today. And I think generally when investors uh, look to fixed income, they look at it in the traditional role being that income generation and capital protection and as an effective hedge against equity correction. And so I think now more than ever, um, fixed income allocations have been in, have become increasingly important uh, in your portfolio. And I think we're because of that, we're seeing a lot of investors um, shift towards ETFs, um, being that they're low cost, uh, extremely efficient, they're enhanced liquidity and the diversification benefit, as well as being you know efficient portfolio construction vehicles. Um, and I think we've said this before in the past webinars, but that's why we're seeing, you know, fixed income being the fastest growing segment of the ETF market. Um, and within bonds, you know, ETFs can represent core positions or satellite exposures within your portfolio. Um, so generally, we see investors turn towards, you know, passive ETFs uh, when they have more confidence in their view and they want to pick their own building blocks around yield curve, credit, or currency views, um, or you know, you know, if they're looking for a particular exposure, uh, like global um, or high yield, they may turn towards active management. So if you go to the next slide, you'll see um, here's an example of you know different ranges of returns um, in different market. So, you know, looking at the high yield fixed income market, you're getting that wider range of return um, as well in fix, as, as well as global fixed income. But when you look at the Canadian market, for example, it's extremely efficient. So you're getting less of that range. And I think that's why we're seeing, you know, investors, you know, really positioned towards the, you know, Canadian fixed income market. Um, and then, you know, we're seeing them shift more towards active management um, and global exposures or high yields where maybe they have less experience or um, they're not as familiar with the market. Um, so different ranges depending on um, the market, but what you can see here is Canadian fixed income in particular is extremely efficient. Because this is a good chart and I appreciate you, Pat, you put together interesting research because what you're really effectively highlighting here is really the range of returns between kind of the bottom end to the top end, including funds and ETFs and the whole works. And then you kind of broke it by category, right? And so you really see the, you know, a wider range of returns and higher yield. It, it Maybe, you know, a place where you want to spend a bit more it could be some active management. I think we, you know, we can look at that. And global fixed income, also a range of returns. Um, again, you know, I think about the cost you're putting in there to, uh, to blend that off, right? Then of course, so you're saying that of course the fixed income place in Canada, more of a tighter range of returns across the board. And what I like about that framework is it really kind of allows somebody to think about active and passive coming together in a, in a solution set across the board. Cause it's not ever just one, it's, it's about bringing the two together. And this kind of lays the framework about where the opportunity set is for using active or passive out there. My, my question for you, Mackenzie, more about is the uh, Canadian fixed income range. You know, we're using the broad market, where is the, um, the broad market sit right now in that range of returns? Yeah, so the Canadian market right now ranges from just under 3% to around 5.5%. Um, so it, it is quite a tight range that you see there. And, you know, looking, for example, at um, our ETF, ZAG, um, the BMO aggregate bond ETF, that's actually right around 5.1%. So, in the upper quartile of that range. So really efficient. And that's something I always like to think about is that, 
you know, North American fixed income, very efficient market, global, you've got that currency overlay, you may want to think about the active aspect of that, and high yield, dependent upon your risk tolerance and, and your views of the marketplace too. So again, mixing active and passive is, is certainly something we can do, specifically in fixed income too. Mackenzie, let's, let's jump in a little bit here. You talked a bit about so, uh, uh, core and satellites. Anything you want to highlight here with the uh, uh, solution sets in the overall marketplace is building blocks? Yeah, so I think, you know, depending on your views and your confidence in the market, um, I think more and more investors are looking to tilt their portfolios, you know, based on turn and exposure. Um, so starting with a strong core, um, you can add ETF satellites. Uh, to achieve your desired exposure. So here I showed a quick example of some of the ETFs that we at BMO ETFs offer. And we really call this our three by three. So we offer short, mid, long exposure. Now, again, across corporate, provincial, and federal exposures as well. So it really allows you to slice and dice the Canadian market, depending on your views, and, you know, add in satellites um, where you want to you know, where you want to be in terms of your, your term or your exposure. So it really allows you to be flexible and, and use these as building blocks for your portfolio. Yeah, effectively what you're getting there is that core broad market. And then my words, kind of the sectors of the Canadian fixed income marketplace. And we're purposely showing you this way so we can lay the framework for the conversation about core and the sectors as we lean forward. Because I'm going to bring Marina back in and ask Marina, can you start give us a little bit of background around the broad market itself in Canada? Of course, we're following the FTSE index, and a few people are following that, of course, too. Maybe give that background, then we'll lean into the sectors in a second. Absolutely, Kevin, and uh, thank you for that. And sectors is exactly the, the way that we would describe the market as well. So when you think about the core market or the broad market index that tracks that market. For the Canadian uh, suite, that is the FTSE Canada Universe Bond Index, which is, of course, the flagship measure of that market. And, you know, it incorporates government and corporate securities at the investment grade, so triple B or higher, uh, in a particular minimum issue size. But within that index, and what's so important uh, of what you guys were talking about, building blocks earlier, is that each one of those sectors um, within the universe that has a modular construct where there's well-defined peer groups of securities uh, that we call sectors. And typically in fixed income, those well-defined uh, peer groups fall into three broad categories. One is a definition by term, and we break up the curve by short, mid, and long. Um, one is by sector, and what we mean by that is corporate versus government, and then within government, federal or provincial debt, and as well as quality. So the uh, credit rating worthiness of the particular counterpart, which is typically how one might further break down the corporate sector. And what's important here is that each one of these parameters or each one of these peer groups have their own behaviors, how they react to particular market conditions, what that means for their return, where they sit across the duration or the term spectrum of the curve, all impacts the returns of each of these underlying components. And what you can see is that for the universe bond index, this is I believe as of June 30th, um, short, mid and long, you know, it's a short, heavy index. So the short part of the curve will be driving the majority of the performance on the aggregate. And you can see here by weights, the federal, provincial, and corporate all encompass about a third each of that index. So they're each one um, their own independent driver of those returns. And at the bottom left here, uh, we've shown you a little bit of the performance graph. And you can see that in the context of Canada, you know, it's the provincials and the corporates, which are represented by that blue and yellow line, that tend to overlap or intersect between each other as the contributors to more return generation or less, or more or less volatility. So thinking about these a little bit more, and if we go to the next chart, you know, each one of these sector relationships, you know, this a third, a third, a third, 
have some long-standing parameters and metrics of how they interact with each other. Why is that important for investors to understand and to really know what you own underlying those portfolios is that each one of those asset categories, um, peer groups or sectors, uh, react in their own way to particular market movements because each exhibits its own characteristics. And some of these characteristics stay uh, static over long periods of time, you know, like average credit quality, for example. However, some of them do move, and they typically move in reaction to particular market dynamics. So what you can see here on the left-hand side are widening of spreads, and you can see the uh, recent uh, period of market volatility. Not all spread widening was even. You could see the provincial sector, uh, which is the bottom three lines here, um, is a lot more resilient to that kind of a move. It did move, but not quite as much as you exhibit the jump in corporates. And so we've obviously come off the kind of highs uh, that were uh, um, that were exhibited at the peak of the crisis. Um, but you also see an inversion of some of the relationships here between kind of the belly and the barbell of the curve. Uh, the other interesting parameter that's driving some of these dynamics and certainly impacting how, uh, you know, the representation of each one of those sectors in the overall core is the issuance pattern. And on the right-hand side, uh, we've shown you kind of a three-year view of issuance across these number of sectors. And you can see kind of at the end of 17, beginning of 18, the spike in corporate issuance. And you can see more recently um, a huge uh, pickup in federal, government uh, federal uh, issuance, so driven by uh, Bank of Canada and the uh, liquidity programs that the banks are sponsoring um, and the issuance of those securities. Of course, provincials issuing those as well. But corporate issuance continues to be at a healthy pace. Um, and we've seen quite a bit of that issuance come out through the first quarter of 2020. What do these issuance mean? And you know what they do tend to do, and if we can look at the next slide, um, they change slightly the dynamics uh, and the exposure of each one of these sectors. So for example, on the, you can see that on the left-hand side, there is a chart that shows you this is the quality within the corporate index. And you can clearly see kind of the increase of triple B issuance. You can clearly see the uh, kind of the downgrades and upgrade cycle between the double A and single A parameters. But more recently, what we've seen is this continued extension of duration within the universe bond index, which was already at historical highs at almost eight years. Um, and has been further pushed out uh, to almost eight and a half um, by a pattern of uh, the Bank of Canada buyback programs. So the central bank is writing a series of liquidity programs where they're buying up debt that has been of federal debt that has been um, concentrated in the short end of the market. And you can clearly see here on the right hand top chart the duration of the, um, sorry, the weight of the short term uh, exposure is reducing quite a bit, uh, being picked up in the mid and the long. Um, the other parameter where this also changes is the interplay and the interbalance between allocation to the federal and corporate versus provincial, right? So what this chart at the bottom right here will show you is that as a mix up, you know, remember we talked a little bit about that each one represents about a third, a third, a third of the overall aggregate index. Well, in reality, over the course of the last six months, you'll see that the provis picked up several percentage points um, of exposure in the benchmark. So what that means is provincials are now a bigger contributor to the overall aggregate index return. Um, and how would that translate? Well, you know, as a, you know, if you're tracking the global market, you are effectively at the, uh, at the exposure of those market dynamics, right? So you move or the global portfolio moves along with those markets. 
However, as Mackenzie and Kevin were mentioning earlier, if you wanted to take a view in a particular sector, like provincials, like short, or like treasuries, etc., you can do uh, by taking on exposures to those particular building blocks that make up the overall whole. Um, in looking at this uh, through a different lens, um, you know, why is this index duration extension meaningful? Well, if we take a look at what's happened to the Government of Canada yield curve, and that's just shown on the next slide here, and of course in bonds, as we all know, the underlying uh, Treasury yields are in direct correlation or in direct driver of the overall performance and returns on the fund. The top line here, the burgundy line, shows you what the Canada curve looked like at the end of December going into this year. Very, very flat, almost no pickup in yield uh, by extending your duration. And of course, you know, duration is associated with a longer term profile, long, um, higher potential risk assessment. So, um, you know, very, very flat curve, um, almost nothing to it. The, the bottom line here is what's showing you what that yield curve looks like at the end of June. So you, you see obviously a huge drop in uh, yields, which of course correlates to higher returns, but you also see a kind of a steepening um, uh, of that curve with the long end going up. So there is now a difference uh, and a compensation, if you will, in terms of yield points for going longer and for taking that longer term view. Um, you know, as rewarded by kind of the, the, the higher yields in the long end of that curve. Uh, so quite a, quite a shift. So what has that, how has that translated to returns? So on the next slide, what we've done is we've kind of shown you a little bit of a heat map, if you will, um, of performance numbers on, um, you know, as they've looked in the year to date, so the last six months, versus the last three-year average. And you can see that the fixed income part of the market has performed extremely well with kind of the long government sector driving a lot of that performance, um, you know, in the double digit uh, growth um, over the last six months. So, you know, that shift in yields, um, you know, and, and that pay for its duration has kind of translated and are shown to you here. Uh, but of course, whenever we think about returns, we always think of them as a risk return profile, right? Or that performance reward for the level of risk that you would be taking on in order to be able to invest there. And we visualize this for you on the next slide, uh, breaking up specifically uh, into short, mid, long, that three by three profile matrix that uh, Mackenzie was showing us earlier. So, you know, you can clearly see these clusters of returns as you move out uh, the risk profile. Of course, the long end of the market um, uh, has uh, significantly more volatility to those returns because they have a lot more rate sensitivity. But by the same token, um, you know, you are getting rewarded for that in, in, in higher return profiles. Um, that dispersion is slightly different in the mid where they're, they're slightly more dispersed. But in the short, you know, you can clearly see that corporates do offer, um, you know, a slight kind of pickup in that return profile for a very similar level of volatility. Uh, what this chart is also interestingly showing you, and this is again coming back to that three by three view that you can take a, a poll at, is, you know, in the long end, the provincial sector, and so the bubble size here uh, gives you a representation of the size of that particular sector within uh, their parameters, right? So the long provincials is the biggest market uh, in, within the long end. And what you can see is obviously that long provincials are driving the performance of the long, um, and in the short end, it's the federal and the corporates that are contributing the most uh, to that performance performance, but a fairly healthy distribution across the curve. Um, but again, you know, those sectors, all of them incorporated within the overall market, um, that peer group division or sector division of the underlying and the correlated uh, funds uh, can give you the ability to kind of play across that curve. That's 
very insightful. And what I really like what you've done here is you kind of give us a framework, of course, the, the you know, the, the core really highlighted how, you know, the different parts of the market, the sectors we mentioned, really add value as you may want to look at overweighting them or underweighting them based upon your views of the marketplace. Mackenzie, I'm gonna, I, maybe bring you back in. Let's talk about your views of the marketplace and give people the, the, maybe a bit of framework itself about how to look about comprising their own view of the marketplace to implement maybe more of a, a sector and a, and a core strategy and where to be in those sectors relative to the core. Yeah, and thanks, thanks, Kevin. Um, and I, I think Marina did a great job of kind of setting the stage and, and you know, bringing it back to our earlier point of, you know, starting with your core and bringing in your satellites um, is a great framework um, to start. And then, you know, there's a couple key questions uh, you need to ask yourself or consider uh, when building out your portfolio, you know, what is your level of conviction over the next year and what's your conviction in your calls you know do you think interest rates are going down further are spreads going to tighten um and typically you know investors who have a strong view are going to favor more satellite so you know they can bring in some of those different areas uh like marina had spoken about and maybe you know if you're less uncertain um about your, you know, what you think is going to happen in the next year, you may stick to more of your core. Um, and then another key question is, you know, what's your view on the economy? Is the economy going to get better? Um, you know, how do you anticipate central ba banks will act this year, uh, being the short term? You know, are they going to get more involved? Could this lower interest rates across the board? And then, you know, what's your view on the economic cycle and inflation? Um, you know. Do you want something to maybe complement inflationary, um, you know, if the central banks do get more involved uh, and maybe look towards something more like a real return bond? Um, so these are all kind of just frameworks to help you, um, you know, guide your portfolio in the sense of things to consider um, when you're looking to add in satellites to your core. Well said, Mackenzie, and well said, Marina, too. Of course, this is just a framework, and really it's up to you and how you build your portfolio, but good to know what your convictions are. Then take a look at your views relative to the marketplace, and that kind of says, do I want to deviate from the core? And if I do, where do I want to be in that core? And that framework makes a lot of sense. Thank you both for that. We're going to spit, shift gears here and answer some of the questions that came in this week. Now, Mackenzie, let me turn to you first on this one. This is about uh, traditional fixed income products don't perform as well as the rates are turning quite low. And, you know, really talking about as the modern fixed income adapted to achieve the risk of the old minimal risk. I, mean, I, I think your framework that you mentioned right off the back and forth, the, 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 the range of returns really spoke to that. Maybe you can take it to the next level and just talk about how they've been adapted going forward. Yeah. I mean, you know, rates are lower and you see, you know, asset allocators are saying, you know, put a heavier weight to equity so you get the potential for returns going forward. Um, but I think you really have to keep in mind, you know, look what happened back in March um, and really think again about the traditional role of fixed income, you know, protection against equity. Um, and I think that will be the primary purpose going forward as, you know, people look for that equity protection, um, you know, in, especially ETFs um, within fixed income are a great solution, you know, they're, they're low fee um, and, you know, it, it allows you to complement your existing portfolio. And I think, um, you know, people are starting to look more at their asset allocation mix um, and trying to hedge against their equity risk. Perfect. And I, again, that range of returns really shows you the efficiency. And again, I like that as kind of that active passive conversation because that's what effectively you're ha having here in this question is really active and passive. And I think you can do both. Just look at uh, your cost relative to your potential range of returns. Let's shift gears to the next question. Um, you know, there's a lot of rebalancing that goes on in ETFs and there's some big volumes that this individual saw on the 19th of uh, the month, you know, is that us doing that? They're just trying to see if that's our footprint in this space. And I think part of this question is trying to get at, you know, what does that mean? Can you game the market? Can I get in beforehand? And can I take advantage of this rebalance that the index does that we know you ETF providers need to follow? 
Mackenzie, maybe you can give us some background about that rebalancing and specifically, can you game the market there taking advantage of this space? So I think the simple answer about, you know, taking advantage of the marketplace is no. Um, you know, everything, especially when it comes to rebalances, is already priced into the market. Um, so you just have to keep that in mind. Um, you know, what you did see in June um, was a spike in, in volumes um, where we did see a lot of rebalancing. And that what we like to call that is a triple witching days. So the third Friday of every quarter, we see options, um, index options and futures expiring. Um, so you will get those peaks of volumes, uh, which is what we saw back then. Um, and, you know, typically on those rebalancing days, you know, you are going to see, um, you know, big spikes in trading, but that's already priced into the market. And I think that's interesting too, because the pricing in the marketplace, and just think of this as an investor, once, you know, this is what an ETF effectively does, it benefits from the dissemination of information. So once the information is made public, everything in instantaneously reprices. So if there is a change in index that is impactful, it will cascade across, and that has already been priced into it as we move into the rebalancing, of course, itself. So thanks for that, Mackenzie. But I think a related question is this one, because this speaks towards what happened in one of our ETFs, ZPR, and actually the whole preferred share marketplace, there's been a pop. And Mackenzie, maybe we could talk about why there was a pop in this marketplace uh, and what's yeah. going on there. Yeah, and I think there's been a lot of headline news um, we've seen come from this in the last little bit, uh, or at least in the last uh, week or so. Um, and what we really saw was the introduction of the new uh, AT1 bonds um, come out, which really act like a prep. Um, with cheaper financing to the bank, um, which to the issuing bank is uh, more appealing and cost them less. Um, so what we'll, we'll likely see, you know, the rest of the banks follow suit. Um, and because of that, I think that's why we saw the market pop, um, you know, in the short term. That was a nice surprise to the press mark, market. Um, and I think, you know, there's a lot of anticipation that the press market, you know, the press will be redeemed that par, um, which is where we saw a lot of that pop come from. And it does actually show the disseminated information because I think that's only one issue that came out, but yet the whole sector of, uh, of preferred shares popped at once right across the board. Marina, maybe come back to you quickly on uh, the AT, AT1s that have just been announced. What's the thoughts of uh, FTSE Russell about including those in the index? Um, thanks, Kevin. Yeah, so we looked at that new LRCN structure that was uh, just announced uh, and uh, the new face, I guess, of the AT1 market. Um, and we ran a number of market consultations, advisory committee kind of announcements. And the index, uh, the, the fixed rate bond index, um, announced that that AT1 deal will not be going into the fixed rate universe bond index. I think investors uh, or across the board felt that it was much more akin um, to what is happening in the PREF space uh, rather than in the kind of the fixed rate IG uh, bond space, which is what's represented by the universe uh, bond index. So uh, our, our view on it and our take on it was that that bond is not going into the, um, into the IG market. But you know, we saw the deal be very, very popular and obviously had an impact on the PREF market um, across the board. Oh, perfect. Thanks for the additional insight too. Appreciate that. Mackenzie, I think we got uh, one more question coming in. This is in regards towards REITs. Individual looked at REITs and uh, uh, sold it off. And now he's looking for something to replace that and looking at the yield between 2.4, 2.5 and 4%, monthly pay it, of course. Uh, you know, looking for an ETF from us, and I want to have direct recommendations, but before we go down into that space, maybe give them a little, uh, let's just talk about a little cautionary tone about the yields and understand all that. Talk us through some of your thoughts. Yeah, um, you know, and I think when you when you look at REIT ETFs across the board, and I mean, not just REIT, but I think with any ETF, it's really important to look under the hood um, and really understand what, what it is that they're holding. Um, so you want to make sure uh, the companies or the individual holdings, you know, have a sustainable dividend yield um, and that they're paying out a sustainable yield. You know, sometimes uh, we see 
um, then pay out, you know, more than what they're earning. Um, so I would just caution around that and, you know, really make sure you understand the holdings of the particular ETF. Um, so, for example, at BMO, you know, we have uh, we do have a re equal weight uh, Canadian ETF, um, and uh, we pay a sustainable yield on that as we pay out what we earn. And you know, can't guarantee that the underlying won't cut their dividend, um, but you know, being equal weighted, uh, we're able to reduce that single security risk. Um, so that if there is something that does get cut, um, you get more of a balanced approach in that. Thanks for that, Mackenzie. That's pretty insightful. I mean, effectively, yes, take a look at not only just the headline yield, but also the underlying yield to make sure that's sustainable too. And it's not just a overpaying the underlying out on a regular basis. Thank you for that. Now we're going to wrap up here. I'm going to quickly highlight that we're not back next week. We're going to take a little bit of break. Hope you don't mind. We're going to come back on August the 7th, uh, again, 1 o'clock. And we're going to talk about that time. We're going to take some time about due diligence and take a look at some tools in the marketplace. So let me first of all say thanks to Marina. Really appreciate you joining us and FTSE Russell's support across the board, as well as Mackenzie. Thanks for joining us. And thank you all. We'll see you here next time on August the 7th at 1 o'clock. Have yourself a good week ahead. Cheers. Thank you.